Anyways, welcome to one of the last talks of the day, except for perhaps the more exciting one coming up about monkeypox. So good afternoon. Welcome back. I hope you're all warm. I'm Janet England. I'm going to start talking about immunizations and the immuno immunocompromised host. And this is the wrong slide. It should be 2023. Oh, well, but the picture of the castle is from 2022. And I just want to give the plug for us all to visit Chateau de Menton Saint Bernard tomorrow, which will be really exciting and has nothing to do with immunocompromised hosts. You should just come. Um, I'd like to also say that I would like to acknowledge Claire and Segrist, who helped me with this talk several years ago. And I'm trying to advance the slides. <laughs> There and and she has really inspired this talk. Some of you went to the the Infovac talk earlier, but but Clarion, for those of you who don't know, is perhaps the only vaccinologist who has ever won the French Legion of Honor medal. I mean, this is pretty impressive. This is something you can all aspire to. You won't get it, but you can aspire to it. Okay, look at that. This is really really outstanding, and it shows that vaccines are really really important. And, and I am so grateful to her for the work she has done with many others in, in designing this course and, and specifically for this talk. Um, trying to, I'm trying to advance the slides, which worked perfectly. Sorry, the AV person worked perfectly just a few minutes ago. Excuse me, the slides are not advancing. And the clock is going, and yet the slides aren't advancing. This is sad. So I would just like to talk to you about immunocompromised hosts. It's really, as with everything in vaccines, there's benefits versus risks. So now I want you to go back one. Okay, it's benefits versus risks. And, in fact, vaccinations in the immunocompromised hosts are very problematic and controversial. And that's because there are underestimated benefits, I believe, I mean, we often don't have efficacy in every single tiny little group of certain immunocompromised patients or even big groups such as HIV patients. And there's delayed or limited demonstration of immunogenicity. Many times people in certain groups are excluded from trials ever, or at least at the beginning. And there's a perception that immunosuppression prevents the the effective vaccine responses. So vaccinations and immunocompromised hosts are controversial, but... The real concern, I think, is the fear of severe adverse events. In fact, if the vaccine does nothing, perhaps that's not so bad. In fact, usually it does something. But there is this perceived fear of severe adverse events, which really have driven our approach to vaccines in immunocompromised people. So the issue, one issue is, is there's no official guidelines for example, many countries have different guidelines. Many of them are not evidence-based or they're evidence-based on small numbers of subjects. And an example of this could be, for example, the use of live vaccines in immunodeficiency patients. Now, this is a good guideline. I think guidelines are good to have, but they should not be absolute rules. They, they can't be. We, we can't do this. We should base it on science and scientific evidence. And so what is the evidence that you should never give a live vaccine as soon as immunodeficiency is suspected? Well, let me give you an answer that I don't know, and we're going to go through this today. I would just like to say that not only do we have to deal with all the old immunodeficiencies, HIV, cancer, congenital immunodeficiency, but we now have new immunodeficiencies. And I don't know how many of you work with some of the new agents. It was so wonderful to hear Patrick Ott yesterday talk about new personalized cancer vaccines. But we in the pediatric field are dealing with new immunotherapies such as CAR T cells, chimeric antigen receptor T cells, which leave people without functional antibody making often for the rest of their life. And this is becoming the in my hospital, a very common treatment and perhaps a treatment of choice for relapsed in, um, childhood um, leukemia. So there's new immunodeficiencies coming up all over. And what are we going to do with all these patients? We don't have data. We don't have evidence. We don't know what to do. So the new CAR T cells therapies are what risk do we have? These children end up getting chimeric T cells that are taken from their body. They're manipulated to make 
antigen receptors for the tumor. They're reinfused into their body. They eat up the tumor cells, which is great. And kids that are on the brink of death within a month are happy and walking and don't need more chemotherapy, but yet they're still at risks for infection. And we have done a study in our center, and others have too, with kids showing risks of bacterial infections and other um, infections, up to 40% of these patients in the first several months after CAR T cells. And this is brand new, and no one knows what to do. And what are we doing? At least in the United States, we're giving immunoglobulin monthly at a cost of tens of thousands of dollars a year, perhaps for the rest of these patients' lives. This is a problem. we got to figure out how to deal with this. But I'm not going to talk all about that. I'm going to go back to all of these types of immunocompromised patients. And I just have here the congenital immunodeficiencies, the, the boxes in red, infants, neonates, prematures. Those really are the populations that we worry perhaps the most about for giving live vaccines. And what is the evidence that we shouldn't do it? Um, in general, that's very good approach, but it's not always the only way. So what's the example? Oral polio virus vaccine. Well, we know we don't particularly want to give oral polio vaccine to severe combined immunodeficiency. Does everybody know SCID, severe combined immunodeficiency? These are the hosts that basically have no T cells at work, no B cells at work. They don't make antibody. They get polio virus and they will excrete it for months and months or years, and they also may get polio themselves. And the risk of vaccine-associated paralytic polio, VAP, in patients with a B-cell deficiency, which includes our SCID patients, is quite high. It's one in 7,000, so it's about 100-fold that in regular healthy patients. And there's a search for poliovirus carriers because we think that also is leading to, for example, the resurgence of polio um, as well as of course, continued VAP in the healthy subjects. So what should we do with our skid patients? And how are we going to identify them if we don't know that they have immunodeficiency because most, because most of these kids in the first month or two of life are pretty healthy? What about BCG in patients with congenital immunodeficiencies? I hope you notice I'm not answering these questions, and I'm not answering these questions really well because I don't think we always have good answers. But BCG vaccine in patients with SCIDS, severe combined immunodeficiency, it really is important, if you can, to not give BCG to these patients. But how are you going to identify it when they're born? It's perhaps nearly impossible. Um, however, there are things that you can do, and certainly looking Doing specific diagnoses are important. Getting family histories, people, women who have lost perhaps their first two or three children before the age of one month is something to think about, um, congenital immunodeficiency. And you can do tests. It's really wonderful. You can do tests. We do screening, looking for TREC screen, screening in, in my state. This is becoming more universal to look to see if there are intact T cells and enough of them in, in, the, in the subject. So there are ways of doing it, but it's not commonly employed, and it's certainly not available in much of the world. What about rotavirus vaccine? The risk of rotavirus vaccine is somewhat increased in children with severe combined immunodeficiency. There's case reports. I don't think we know the incidence. Maybe we're going to know more. But... In the presence of chronic diarrhea following rotavirus vaccine, we do think that we should be looking for immunodeficiency. But how are we going to find a child with immunodeficiency that early when we really want to give the rotavirus vaccine, you know, in the first months of life? So tricky questions here. So I would just propose that if we're going to, to take care of children, we need to find more and better cost-effective ways of diagnosing congenital immunodeficiencies. And this is the TREC assay. I would just say those of you who have heard of the bubble boy, this this little boy who was born without an immune system and they kept him in a bubble for his first six months of life, six years of life, and then gave him a bone marrow transplant. Have you seen the movie? There's a movie about it. It's really sad because at the end, they let him go out and see the nature and then he dies. So it's really sad. Um, and these days we would transplant these kids in the first six months of life. And we now have about a 98% survival. But Back when the movie was made, it was sad. And how are we diagnosing them in the first six months of life? We do it by doing this TREC assay. And a TREC assay is a T-cell receptor excision circle in the blood looking for, for the presence of thymic immigrants, which detects low T-cells. And you can say, oh, that's really tricky. Well, our cost now is down to about $2 a test. And it's done in, in almost all of the 50 states in the United States and, and moving on. So 
we need to have an automated point of care test that could be cheap, that could be done with readily available materials for the rest of the world. It's not the only way of doing it. But we, we have options. We need to be creative and we need smart people like you to figure out how can we do this. Rotavirus vaccines in preterm infants. There's been a real concerted effort and, um, and we talked a little bit about rotavirus vaccines, but should we give rotavirus vaccine to preterm infants? After all, they're the ones at highest risk for having bad outcomes of rotavirus diarrhea. In fact, they often can die of rotavirus diarrhea. And the U.S. CDC guidelines say you should only immunize at hospital discharge. Our premature infants in my hospital often stay in the hospital for many, many months, and they're therefore not eligible to get rotavirus vaccine. So it's really a problem. So what should we do? Should we just take it? Should we take this dogma, sorry, CDC, this dogma that we shouldn't do it, or should we do a study about it? So we did a study about it. We did a study of rotavirus vaccine in a neonatal ICU, um, a prospective study of 385 infants. And Umesh just told me they've done another study in Philadelphia. So we're going to have two studies. There's two studies out of Japan. Yes, you can give it in a newborn ICU. It is safe, and the virus doesn't transmit among the different children. So you can't just take somebody saying you can't do it. You need to carefully study it, decide what to do, and then hopefully ACIP Matthew can make some changes in some of the recommendations. Because without vaccinating them at their correct age, as you all know, you need to, to give the rotavirus vaccine early in life for the first dose. So if you if they're already too old by the time they go home, they miss out on rotavirus vaccine totally. So what is the evidence we have for giving live for not giving live vaccines in um in these patients with congenital immunodeficiency, infants, neonates, or prematures? Well, OPV, there's good evidence if there's a B cell deficiency. BCG, there is high risk if there's SCID, severe combined immunodeficiency or even another disease, chronic granulomatous disease. And rotavirus, there's an increased risk of skid, but there's not an increased risk if they're premature. So what you need to do, what one needs to do, what clinicians need to do and public health people is break down the risks, analyze it, do some background study, and perhaps you can change our recommendations. So let's move on to HIV-1. And I'm not going to have time to go through every single thing, but Every single category probably needs special study, special consideration. What evidence is there for using live vaccines in HIV-positive patients? Well, should we be giving BCG vaccine to our HIV-positive babies at birth? Lots of studies ongoing. Don't have time to talk about that, although I'm very, it's a very interesting subject. But if you have an HIV-infected patient, BCG vaccine can actually disseminate, and that is bad. That can be in a baby or an adult, and there are risks, but this really happens at the time of CD4 depletion and AIDS. And if you have a program in place where you can identify potentially HIV-infected mothers and potentially HIV-infected babies, you can approach this, this problem a little bit differently and, yes, give BCG or perhaps delay it until it's proven if the, if the baby actually is HIV-infected. It's tricky. Safety of rotavirus vaccine in HIV-infected patients. Really, really a good and important study, and it's great that we have the data from multiple studies throughout Africa, South Africa, Kenya, another one from South Africa, saying that rotavirus vaccines are safe and they're effective in asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic HIV-infected infants. Again, having data makes us have this decision a little bit easier. And it means that you can't say no live vaccines in any immunodeficient person ever, because that's just not the case. It depends. What about varicella zoster vaccine in HIV-infected patients? I think we have good data. Again, multiple studies. I'm not going to go into all the, all the data. And you have the slides so you can look up some of these studies. But the VZV vaccine is safe in children that have at least a moderate T cell count, a T cell count in kids of 25%. For us in peds, that's pretty low, but that's okay. That's okay if you wanted to get a VZV vaccine, um, even down to 15%, and it's very effective, up to 80% effective. And in countries that use regularly chickenpox vaccine, VZV vaccine, we should continue to do that. Measles vaccine, this is a big one. And for those of us who've had to deal with measles, and we've never had to deal with measles before, this has been a real problem before the pandemic. 
now now it's coming up again. For those of you who deal with measles on an everyday basis, it's really an important problem too. And so we have data showing that measles vaccine, a live vaccine, is safe in children with a CD4 count over 15%. It's safe in six-month-olds. It's in a meta-analysis. It's safe in HIV-infected children. And in adults, it really is quite safe. There has been a couple of patients, and that's bad, who have had disseminated measles, presumably measles virus disease. But it does appear to be safe in HIV patients with a CD4 count over 15% or 200 per microliters. And it can be given either before or after immune reconstitution. And many of us who've had to deal with measles think that a measles vaccine is a lot, lot safer than getting measles disease in a patient with HIV and particularly one with AIDS. So what is the evidence for HIV-1? OPV is safe. BCG, perhaps, is certainly for high risk for those who have very symptomatic AIDS. Rotavirus is safe. VZV, MMR are safe, again, with a caveat of the CD4 count. And yellow fever vaccine, which I didn't talk about, again, we'd like to have a reasonable CD4 count. And now with a lot of yellow fever around, it's something to think about. Not only is it safe, not only is it effective, there's no worsening of HIV disease with receipt of these vaccines. Um, cancer and chickenpox vaccine, varicella vaccine. I think really we know in children that if they get chemotherapy for leukemia and lymphoma, that they will often lose their immunity after chemotherapy to chickenpox. And we really would like to re-immunize them. What our practice is, is you don't re-immunize them during their induction chemotherapy, but, but after they're on maintenance chemotherapy where they begin to have lymphocytes. And I don't want to get into a whole lot of detail. Happy to talk about it with you individually. But really, we want to check immunity in children um, who have cancer and are undergoing cancer treatment, all kinds of cancer treatment, and consider revaccinated if, if they um, are seronegative. What about stem cell transplant, bone marrow transplant? We call it hematopoietic stem cell transplant. They have incredibly high risks of varicella and zoster after hematopoietic stem cell transplant. I mean, the risk in the first year after transplant is about 10%, and it goes, it continues to, to go up during the next five years. So we have fatalities due to herpes zoster in our adults, and we have bad disease due to chickenpox in our children. Even today in the United States where and in the UK where, where there's not as much chickenpox in the population. We have a new subunit vaccine, Shingrix, which is not a live vaccine, that is really helping us for adults, but you have to be 18 years of age and older. So we'd love to give the Shingrix vaccine to, well, we want to give it to adults so they don't get shingles, and we'd love to give it to children. Um, I understand there's studies ongoing, but I don't know where they stand now. And certainly COVID put a stop to many of the studies many centers were doing. So what is the evidence for cancer in HSCT patients? Well, giving BCG during cancer treatment is probably not a good idea. We don't have studies. We probably should just avoid it until after the cancer treatment is, is completed. Rotavirus, there's no data. We really don't do that much cancer treatment for kids under six months of age. LAIV, that's live attenuated influenza vaccine. It's expected to be safe, and we've done studies in kids with leukemia, and it is safe. Varicella zoster vaccine is safe under specific conditions. MMR, a little bit trickier, not good data, um, for, but we do have data for two years following transplant. And then finally, yellow fever. I, I know of no data of yellow fever vaccine in our um, HST patients. Okay. What about our solid organ transplant patients? Solid organ transplant patients are, are quite common now. Children get, can get a kidney from their parent or a heart from a deceased donor or a lung or a liver. So there's a lot of solid organ transplant patients going on now. So there are some official recommendations for the use of live vaccines in this patient population. And if you look at the vaccines, all of them say, yes, give the vaccine prior to transplant of a solid organ. And that's great, except for the mean age for a liver transplant these days is about three months. So how can you give all these vaccines when the baby is still pretty little? Many of these organ transplants are done because there's congenital 
problems. And so you have to transplant the kid relatively early. And they say, also say the official recommendations say, don't give it after transplant. Well, children who get a liver transplant at three months, again, these days have a probably a 75% chance of survival and they survive years and years and years and years. So you're not going to ever give them a vaccine for the next 50 years. I, that just doesn't make sense to me. It, it certainly doesn't, didn't make sense while we were having measles outbreaks. What are we supposed to do? Well, um, what do you do? You do some studies and you do them carefully and you start with something that's pretty easy. Think about it. If you start with, with things like um, chickenpox vaccine where you can treat with acyclovir, that's an easy way to start and evaluate a live vaccine in a solid organ transplant patient. So here we have um, studies of VZV immunization after liver or liver intestine transplants. Small numbers, 16 patients, looks good. They got a little rash immunogenicity in the US, Switzerland, um, some nice data, Japan. It's great. We need to accumulate this data. We need people like you and working with your colleagues to help bring this data together because really getting chicken pox following a liver transplant is really, really dangerous. We would really like to prevent it with a vaccine. What to do about measles resurgence? Yeah, we, we've had a lot of measles res resurgence in my community, which has a lot of anti-vax sentiment going on. And the official recommends, recommendations are against using MMR post-solid organ transplant. So they say give it pre-solid organ transplant, but what if the baby's too young? They're three months of age. Well, you can't do it. What about a stable subject who's five years post-transplant, has a good CD4 count, is on minimal immunosuppression, and has no rejection, and is doing great, and there's measles in your county? measles in your city. What are you going to do? Well, I think, and many think with me, you should consider MMR and the risk-benefit ratio. And then, not only that, follow up, get the immunogenicity data, put it together, talk with your colleagues, talk with your national NITAG or whatever, and really help us understand, can we do this? And, and we, have, we are accumulating good data now through the solid organ transplant group that we can do that in these kind of selected patients. Would you give, would I give an MMR vaccine to someone six months post a liver transplant who's on three different immunosuppressives and, and rejecting? No, 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 no. But would I do it in these patients? Yes. So for SOT, what evidence do we have? BCG, no evidence. Avoid it. Rotavirus, there's really no data. Perhaps avoid it. LAIV, live, live attenuated flu vaccine, probably safe. VZV, safe under conditions that I just talked about having being stable. MMR, limited data on studies are ongoing. And yellow fever, I don't know about yellow fever. Maybe people here can tell us about yellow fever because I don't know what to say. I guess it certainly is a risk-benefit discussion where you live, how much danger you have. But yellow fever does have some toxicity in immunocompromised patients. So what about immunization altogether of hematopoietic stem cell transplant patients? And that is actually my kind of my halftime job these days. And we've, we've written paper, how do I vaccinate them? When should I vaccinate them? And in fact, the Europeans have different rules than the Americans and they do it differently than South Americans. Okay. We're all trying to do the best for our patients. Again, what data do we have? Um, I would like to specifically talk about flu vaccine. I was, and that's Michelle asked about this question, but I think one of the most important questions is flu because flu happens every year. We know that these transplant patients get bad flu disease when they haven't been vaccinated. And we have all these choices. Kathy Newsom talked about all these different choices and plans, even now that we could give, should we give one dose or two doses? Should we give high, high dose? Should we give cell based? What should we do? Um, one of the graduates from this from this course, Natasha Halasa, worked to put together a study, and I was part one of the subgroups. And this was a controlled trial of comparing high dose trivalent versus standard dose quadrivalent. That is, so three subtypes in the in the high dose, and four in the in the standard dose, given as two doses in pediatric HCT patients. It was published a couple months ago. The adult study for this has similar results, but it's not yet published but it's coming out soon. Okay. 
What was the reactogenicity? I think this is an important question. These kids and their families have been through a lot. If you give a vaccine that's really, really reactogenic, parents don't like it, kids don't like it, and you're giving two doses. And in fact, the red, if you look in the red, the high dose TIV really had a little bit more reactions. The bars go further out either side, following post-dose one and post-dose two. But they weren't severe reactions. They had, they had mild fever and they had some grade three, but the grade three reactions were really less than 5%. And we were, I was expecting worse. So that's good. The, the standard dose quadrivalent again had fever basically only after the second dose. So we thought the reactogenicity was relatively reasonable, but it was a little bit higher after the high dose. And then we looked at the antibody responses, and I don't have time to go over all these, but we looked at the HAI or hemagglutination inhibition titers to specific antigens to H1N1, H3N2, B. victoria, and B. yamagata. And as someone has pointed out here very astutely, there is not much or any B. yamagata circulating, but in our quadrivalent, we had the B. yamagata um, antigen, and we were able to compare the, the the high dose versus the standard dose and the red versus blue, and we were able to show that there was actually increased antibody production as measured by the HAI in the high dose vaccine. Not terribly much, but some. And any little advantage I can get in my bone marrow transplant patients, I want to take. So we have the flu data now, and we also have other live vaccines. And I'm going to move on now to the juvenile rheumatoid arthritis ones. We also have data on varicella and and um, MMR. So I don't have time to go over this all, but basically there's no significant trigger of exacerbation. So with vaccinations and the immunocompromised host, I believe we have underestimated benefits and we have increased fears of adverse events. And if vaccines are safe, which I've told you at least many of them are, even partial efficacy is superior to a lack of efficacy, which is a result of a lack of immunization. If you don't give the vaccine and say the vaccine only works 50% of the time, that's you're missing that chance of 50%. So with that, what to do, what to do for COVID vaccine, I'm not going to talk about that except to say here that really we have data that shows more doses are better mRNA in immunocompromised patients of all kinds, more doses are better. And I don't want to go over that. Even their T cells are better. There's all kinds of things. Oncology patients, cancer patients, transplant patients. And now what are we facing? We're facing many new immunosuppressive therapies. This is just, there are so many new drugs, therapies, monoclonal antibodies, immunomodulators, T cells, Cancer vaccines, there's all this stuff going on all over, some of it proven, some of it unproven. And how are we going to handle the vaccination status in all these kids? It's going to be tough unless we have lots of people working on this, doing prospective studies, doing retrospective chart reviews, helping us all figure out the best way to handle these kids. There's going to be new drugs, and the challenges remain. Maximize the expected benefits of vaccination implement the interventions required, and then contribute to update our missing or largely empirical policies. We need some research on this, and I'll be the first to say we would need more research. So thank you very much. So questions? Back. Thank you so much. I have a question about definitions. Um, so can we use the terms being immunodeficient and being immunocompromised in, interchangeably? And how does one actually define that? You know, are there some guidelines as to how one should use in order to define whether you are immunodeficient or immunocompromised? So those those two terms are not the same. And in fact, those of us who work clinically um, for immunodeficiencies, we go through the there's there's really strict guidelines. Many of these are genetically modified, and we have definitions through our immunology colleagues. So immunodeficiency, they're not all congenital, but many of them you're born with, and we have strict definitions, and, and they're in textbooks and things like that. And and what was the other question, immunodeficiency? The definition of immunocompromised. Immunocompromise. Yeah. Oh, and then the, the transplant, the oncologists, and everybody else will argue to the death about what's immunocompromised. I mean, I, you know, is it 200? CD4 positive cells per cubic millimeter or 500 or is it 400 or is it 300? And, and in fact, I know through 
the pediatric oncology group, it actually should be age dependent because little kids have a lot, should have a lot more CD4 positive T cells. Most people use different definitions. And so when you look at guidelines like the European guidelines and the American guidelines, you have to look at what they define. Often the count is 200 to 500 Mm -hmm. and often, um, yeah, and often it is age dependent. So, So So I can't give you a simple answer. But do we then have some estimates as to what is that population across, you know, different regions, et cetera? Can, can we actually use it as a denominator to then be able to estimate the total size of that population? Um, the answer is I don't believe so because I don't think we have good data from many, many countries. But in our country, we think that probably about 7% of our patient population is what we call immunocompromised, which may include immunodeficiencies as part of it. And and then the question is, at what level of steroid use do you consider someone immunocompromised? I, I We use usually less than one milligram per kilo per day for more than two weeks. So there's also the medication element of that. So um, so can we estimate, I think some countries that have a very good handle on who's getting cancer treatment, who's getting HIV treatment, who can actually diagnose immunodeficiency at birth, those countries can do it. Um, I do not know, and maybe other people know how other countries around the world diagnose that. Thank you. But it's usually less than 10%. But it, it, it Depending on how you def- define it and how much HIV you have in your community, it could be even more than 10%, 20%. Yes, Michelle. Thanks um, for a great talk. So just thinking about adult population, because that's who I work with, we've really struggled with um, defining immuno compromised according, trying to stratify them because, they, as you know, they're not all the same. And... Um, and that was relevant particularly with our Zostavax program because in the, let's call them severely immunocompromised, we actually had some deaths with, when Zostavax was given. But in the absence of Shingrix being available, we, we had no other option for the mildly immunocompromised. So my question is, do you think it's ever going to be feasible with all of the new agents that are coming um, on the market that affect the immune system to stratify immunocompromised into mild, moderate, or severe, because in some situations, I think immunization providers find that helpful with using live vaccines or completely not using live vaccines. I personally think it's not going to be possible because every month they introduce five new monoclonal antibodies and new drugs, pembrolizumab, and you know all these other things. Uh, so, so. I, we have, at least in our hospital, we have difficulty keeping up with even just the ones for children. Um, I, I would say I do not know. I would have happily there. Does someone know? If you know, that would be great. I, I always have to. So we use pneumococcal vaccines to uh, diagnose CVID, of course. And I always think of can't we use vaccines as a diagnostic in the immunocompromised to, to define the net state of immuno? I think that's a great question or a great point. Of course, you have to have the resources to do it. And and checking your pneumococcal titers is really controversial. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying this is what I live with. Who's going to do your titers and do you believe them? So it's very controversial. But if you have a good lab that can really assess the various subtypes of the pneumococcus readily and easily and quickly enough to give the res- Oops, the results back. But as long as it's not a whatever tornado. Um, so I, I think, I mean, I think there, I think there's a need to do that. And I think that's a great idea. And in fact, many of us do that in our transplant patients. We give a pneumococcal. We have two, everyone who goes through a bone marrow transplant. If you go through a bone marrow transplant, whether you're two years old or 70 years old, we consider you to have no immunity to anything and you have to be revaccinated for everything. And these people get 20 vaccines post transplant, these, these adults. They don't like it, but they do it. Um, and we measure antibodies and, uh, and so does everybody. I mean, everybody who takes care of these patients. And one of the defining moments of doing if they're fully engrafted is if they, we, we take certain antibody titers and, and some is some pneumo 19. I mean, we do certain things to find out what's going on. I think that's a great idea. And if we could automate it, make it more cheap and make it more available, that would even be 
better. But, uh, okay, well, I think there's not a whole lot of questions. This is a really specialized area. It was so nice having the, the people from Geneva talk about how they handled some of their patients at the University of Geneva Hospitals because it's really tricky. And I would just say the one final comment I have is that no one person knows it all because th a lot of this is the data. Perhaps not all of us are up to date on all the data, but a lot of it is also experience. And so it's very helpful to have colleagues with whom you can question. And, and through our group, we have the work group within the bone marrow transplant committee and the ID group who talk about it and, and do postings through the solid organ transplant group. Those people do it. So it's very helpful to have colleagues to discuss this with and put out position papers, knowing that your position papers may not be based on a lot of data, but then it can inspire some of the rest of you to do some good studies for us. So, so thank you very much.